Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Here's what we got going on. We've been doing this thing where we want you to get some uncommon common sense. And we've been giving you statements. Last week, we gave you a statement that says, history has a vacuum. What we were saying with that is this. The history you made, past tense, can affect the history you want to make, future tense. Say it differently or in different words, history has influence and that influence can act as a vacuum. And that vacuum can have a tendency to try to pull you back. Now the pull can be back to something positive or it can be back to something negative. If that pull is back to something negative though, what we want to do is instead of succumbing to that negative vacuum, we want to work on resisting that thing. We want to work on avoiding that thing. And we don't underestimate the draw of bad history because even bad history can be attractive. It can be attractive simply because bad history kind of points you back to something that's certain. And because that thing is certain, it's known. And when something is known, oddly enough, it can provide you with some comfort. Whether consciously or subconsciously, a person is drawn to that certainty, drawn to that comfort of bad history, because quite frankly, it's just familiar. I don't have to think about being there. I know what it's like to be there. I know the words I use. I know how I act. I know the places I go. I know the people that I deal with. You know what? When I get in that thing, I just kind of fit right back into the saddle. It's comfortable to me, almost like I'm on autopilot when I'm there. That world is familiar. That world is familiar and it's a known. And just because it's a known, it gives me certainty. And when I have certainty, I am more comfortable. You know what I have in my mind. I've already told you this. When I hear that a person craves certainty, I believe that person is really searching for stability. And that's okay. Because stability as a, as a human, that's normal that you want your life to be stable. That's normal that you want things to be, to be certain. I got to tell you, though, it kind of bothers me because I don't think anybody should ever fall back into the arms of bad history just for stability's sake. Amen. Stability for stability's sake is not, it's not good enough. It shouldn't work for you. It doesn't work for me. It shouldn't work for you. Our preference is if that bad history is going to be there, we ideally want to eliminate it completely. But if we can't eliminate that draw, that pull, that vacuum of bad history, then we want at a minimum to minimize, and inf to minimize its influence and control over our life. There's also a thing called good history, though. And good history is good stuff. When we looked at good history, we said good history can act as a corrective measure. It can act as that thing that kind of jerks the slack out of you, that kind of puts you back in line, that kind of sets you back to where you're supposed to be. Good history can be that thing that we said picks you and back up and puts you back on your feet. When we say good history, we want that vacuum of good history to work in our favor. Good history can be beneficial because good history can pull you up out of the pit. What kind of pit? Well, you name the pit, the pit of despair, the pit of depression, the pit of hopelessness. It can pull you out 
and pick you back up, straighten up your back, pick up your, your chin, stick your chest out and get you down the road that God wants you to be on. That's good history. So what we want to do is we want to make sure starting right now that we produce as much good history as possible. Here comes your common sense statement for today. It is this. Your posture sets the stage. Your posture sets the stage. People in close relationships sometimes argue. Now, for some people, unfortunately, they argue all the time. If you are a husband and a wife, this is something that might hit you kind of real. There are some seasons in your marriage that you feel like there is more fussing going on than calm. One thing I've learned over the years in being a, a pastor, a father, a, 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 a husband, almost left you out, Greta. <laughs> husband, a friend, you name it. One thing I've learned from all of these years is that when you're engaging people, when you're interfacing with folks and folks are in your circle, a lot of the atmosphere and the vibe that surrounds you in that moment, that's up to you. Believe it or not, you can heavily influence the emotional air that exists in your space. Turn to Proverbs 15, verse 1, King James Version. For me, that realization kicked in when I started taking to heart some of the biblical wisdoms such as is found in this verse right here. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, King James Version. It reads, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. This verse says to me that in the midst of elevated emotions, I have the ability to set the stage. Such revelation benefited me at a young age. Why? Because I married early in life. And when I married early in life, I didn't just marry, but the woman I married, the woman that God gave to me, this woman had Stubborn, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what you think. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind tendencies. By the way, it's the same woman I'm married to today. <laughs> but that was, that was her tendencies. And let me tell you right now, I, I wasn't perfect either. None of us were perfect. But you see, that's what we were dealing with. Both of us there, young, each of us having our own personalities, trying to make work something that we were rookies at. Here's what I want to share with you regarding us. And as a matter of fact, let me even take a step backwards, because before I actually delve into us, in order for me to get you a proper picture of what I want to share in total, I need to give you a little slight tad more detail on my background. I grew up in a male-centric place. 
most of the men I grew up with were loud and rowdy. And many of them, whether they want to admit it or not, were male chauvinists. My father was on a, a level of that spectrum that was on the far end. He wasn't on the extreme end of that. He was more laid back and easygoing. Although, don't get me wrong, there are some flashes of moments in his life that you could very well see. He knew very much how to fit in with that male pack. My two grandfathers, on the other hand, were old school men's men, if that makes any sense to you. I don't want to paint the picture that my upbringing was negative. To the contrary, it was not. Life for me as a young person growing up was quite enjoyable. Many, many aspects of that world, though, just, they just weren't conducive to building healthy relationships as an adult. But I was ignorant to that fact then. I didn't know any better. It's what I had learned. It's what I knew. Well, kind of fast forward. I, I absorbed a lot of those, you know, testosterone tendencies. And when I got married, I took my own version of that stuff into our union. I took it right in. Once again, I didn't know any better. It's what I, it's what I had been trained to do, what I had been trained to think. It also formed my parenting style. It was who I was. Not only did it form my parenting style, it formed every aspect about me. Once again, I was very ignorant. And in the early stages, my marriage and my parenting suffered because of my ignorance. Of course, at times we had good times, but I also ended up with a whole bunch of undesired results because that was me. Unknowing to me, I was domineering. I was male-centric myself. I had that sprinkling of male chauvinism in me too. I had become what I had been steeped in. And there I was, married with children, trying to be something that was not conducive to a very good relationship and what I was trying to build. Now, we're going to compound that with this fact of my wife, Greta, she's no, she's no, no, she was no stranger to being mouthy and starting riffs. And it, she was no stranger to that. And in addition to that, she grew up in a single mother. You got to be able to stand on your feet on your own environment. So needless to say, we had our share of arguments. But back to our scripture, having that background. And before we read this scripture again, let me just add this to it. I'm going to be sharing with you some accounts of our family, my personal accounts. I don't want you to assume, though, that those accounts are strictly focused on the family dynamic. Please listen carefully. Please observe carefully. Because they apply across the board. Proverbs 15, verse 1 says this, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. One day when I read that scripture, the Holy Spirit said to me, the Spirit of God said to me, you know what I mean, the Holy Spirit said to me, Son, your posture sets the stage. As you are in your space, 
so shall your space be. Posture, of course, the spirit wasn't talking to me just about standing up straight. But posture, as it relates to the positioning of my attitude, the words I use, the tone of my voice, all the messaging that conveys from me, every piece of communication, both verbal and nonverbal. I thought long and hard about those words. Those words just running through my mind and racing through my spirit. Your posture sets the stage. As you are in your space, so shall your space be. I couldn't, I couldn't seem to let those words go. Or maybe those words just wasn't going to let go of me. I began to look at that in different versions. Here are, some, here are two good versions of Proverbs 15, verse 1. In the Message Bible, it reads like this. A gentle response diffuses anger, but a sharp tongue kindles a temper fire. The Living Bible. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words cause quarrels. These verses explain that gentle words diffuse anger and harsh words cause quarrels. It began to sink into me and I said, ah, my posture sets the stage. As I am in my space, so shall my space be. Family, a light came on inside of me. And I began to observe and view my interactions with my wife in a manner in which I had never viewed it before. I want to share that imagery with you just the way the Holy Spirit gave it to me. It's something that shaped and molded me 20 some odd years ago, but it, it still sick, sits heavy on me today as a lesson I'll never forget. So here we go. I want you to imagine. You've all seen movies, right, where there's a guy or a girl, quote unquote, talking to God, and they're in a space that's just all white. Just all white. And then whatever God says, you know, poof, they're there. They're in the forest. And then poof, they're there. They're on the ship. And then poof, they're there. They're on the moon. Whatever it is. I'm going to invite you into my head. Because this is the way it was presented to me. The image was so vivid. It changed me. So here I am. The Holy Spirit says to me, son, you see this box? I don't remember exactly if it was a box, but we're going to make it a box today. He said, do you see this? I said, yes, I see that. He says, open it. Okay. I reached down. I open it. No big deal. He says, what's in it? I said, well... Huh. It's boxing gear. He says, well, what, what do people use boxing gear for? I said, the box. He says, that's right. But let me be even more general with you, son. They use it to fight. He says, take it out and, and put it on for me. Okay. He says, as you're taking it out to put it on, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that you're in the room and you're in that room by yourself. Now you're in that room by yourself 
And then all of a sudden, somebody else enters the room. They see you. You see them. As you see them, you begin to put on this gear. And you begin to walk towards them intently. <laughs> now he says, if that person is unable to leave, what is their likely response? What is their likely positioning? I said, I don't know. He says, their likely positioning is to brace for battle. Their likely positioning is to brace for a fight. Yeah. Son, this is the atmosphere that you're putting together in the presence of your wife. This is what it looks like. But the bad part is you never take your gear off. You never take your gear off. You wear it around the house all day. You even wear it to bed. The word says that you should not let the sun go down on your wrath. But you fall asleep in it. And you wake up ready for confrontation, already dressed for a fight the next day. You try to work in it. And in your mind, you spar with her all day. As you come home, you're plotting out your plan of attack. You're thinking about how you can break your opponent down. What body shot you should use to immobilize your opponent how to make it last the fewest rounds possible, how to dominate that thing. You're thinking about how to crush your opponent. And yes, let me be clear. When I say your opponent, I'm talking about her. I'm talking about your wife, the person that you said you love and protect. But who protects her against her protector? You walk in your house prepared for a fight and you get one. You walk in dressed for battle and you get exactly what you dressed for. All of that, son, could end. It can go away. But you have to take that gear off. My response was, why? She got on gear too. You see, it's not like I was the only one in the house dishing out body blows and head shots. Greta is a formidable opponent. <laughs> it's not. Lightweight against heavyweight. There's two heavyweights in there. <laughs> he says to me, son, she comes gloved up because you're gloved up. If you take your gear off, Eventually, she'll take her gear off. A person only wears fight gear to a fight. If you set the stage of peace, there's no need to bring items of war. Ask Jesus. Okay, I understand. But you asking me to take my gear off right now. If I do, if I ungear, I'm exposed because she still got gear. 
she's still going to come at me. She's still going to do battle with me. That means I'm taking body blows. I'm taking headshots. What am I supposed to do? He said, perhaps, perhaps, but you're the head. And my grace is sufficient for you to bear up under the pressure patiently. You have to decide what you want in the end. You have to decide. Now, I can't make you take your gear off. You have to deem that her heart is worth it. Because if you don't take your gear off, you're going to keep hurting her emotionally. You're going to keep damaging the very person that should be your best friend. You're going to crush the spirit of the very individual that you vowed to love and protect. I can't make you take this gear off, but you're going to have to do that because you deem that her heart is worth it. I pondered those words. And you know what I did? I deemed that her heart was worth it. And I took off my gear. I stopped arguing with Greta. I stopped raising my voice at her. No matter what she said, no matter her tone, look, no matter how much I wanted to take my hands and put it around that lovely neck, <laughs> just, good morning, Clarice. <laughs> no matter. No matter how much she angered me, no matter how much I just absolutely wanted to retaliate, I didn't. Everybody shot, I took it. Every shot to the jaw, mine to embrace. Why? because I deemed her heart was worth it. That was my posture and that remains my posture until the same day. The gear came off and it stayed off. But I ain't gonna lie to you, it wasn't easy at first. Why? I had that vacuum of negative history pulling me back offering me suggestions on what I should say. And the suggestions were many. Offering me suggestions on what I should do. And likewise, the suggestions, many. But I had deemed that she was worth it. I deemed that she was worth it then and she's still worth it now. That gear came off never to come on again. Eventually, Greta stopped dressing for war. And our disagreements got more and more kind, all because I realized and took the position that my posture sets the stage. Even to the day, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm able to completely diffuse any disagreement that we get into, but I can tell you this, that every single misunderstanding or disagreement, or even I go as far to say argument that we have to this day is far, much, far less volatile because I maintain a calm demeanor. 
Unsurprisingly, though, I can share with you this also, that the Holy Spirit is a complete teacher. He didn't just talk to me about my marriage alone. As a matter of fact, the imagery I just shared with you really didn't start with Greta. This whole fight imagery started with the Holy Spirit directing me to look at me and my children. It started with my parenting. It started with my parenting and it just happened to be something that also fit with my marriage. So, hey, why come up with a new analogy if the old analogy still works? The Holy Spirit is just efficient like that. You know we have three children. We have three children that God has allowed us to birth into our home. All of them have their distinct God-given traits. I love them all totally, completely. My youngest child, Eric, Eric has always been a little bit more unique. And, and I don't mean unique in a bad way. I mean unique. You know, he's always been a processor. He's always been a thinker. He's that child that he could be off by himself all day. And, and be completely fine. Even today, he is uniquely himself. Remember, though, remember my upbringing. My upbringing had me with very aggressive tendencies. And that upbringing, it, it, it affected my parenting style. It affected my parenting style to the point that as a parent, I had two gears. Gear one was raise my voice and fuss. Gear two was spank. Just the two. <laughs> Those were my parenting gears. Gears steeped in aggression. I'm not in any means promoting a lack of discipline. I'm talking about aggression. When I, thought, when I think through that, here's the other example I want to share with you. There was a day when my son Eric, he's at home. Everyone's home, but he's at home in the family room. He's playing on the floor. He's playing on the floor, doing his thing. He's about two years old, so doing whatever two-year-olds do. Playing with a bunch of everything, doing a bunch of nothing. He's two. Well, I want to go over, and I want to I wanna hug him. I want to embrace him. I want to play with him. So... I go over to hug him, and when I reach for him, he cowers. He cowers back, hands in front of his face, into a little ball, almost like someone, like in a movie when something's falling on him. He cowers just like this. I froze. I was motionless. The Holy Spirit said to me, he sees you as an aggressor. As much as I love my son, in his mind's eye, I was a threat. The very opposite of what I had aimed to be. Unintentionally, here I was developing bad history with my child. My child viewed me as a man dressed for war, and I was warring against him. So there I stood, and the Holy Spirit put me in this gear. Boxing gloves on, 
headgear on and, and realize it's the same if I were in a metal helmet holding a shield and a sword. The bottom line is I'm dressed for a fight. In the mind of my child, I was an aggressor. I just pondered that image in my mind to give you a feel for how long ago that was. That was when Eric was two. Eric is now 20, 21 years old. I took a few steps back and looked at my son. Figuratively speaking, at that moment, I took off my gear. I let it fall to the floor. I got down on both knees. And I opened my arms and I waited for that boy to come to me. I just waited. When he got to me, I grabbed him and I hugged him for with me what felt like forever. I had to take off that gear, that armor of war, that armor of, aggressor, of an aggressor so that my son could see his father. At that moment, I changed my parenting style completely. I revamped how I address all my children. I dampened my aggression way down. I made my motions purposeful. I definitely curbed the way I use my words. I needed them to not see me as a threat. I needed them to see their father for who their father was, someone who loved them, someone who could protect them from outside threats, not be a threat in their very own home. If you go to Proverbs 16, I began to govern my words strictly. Proverbs 16, starting in verse 23 in the King James Version. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. The Passion Translation of verse 24, Proverbs 16, verse 24 says this. Nothing is more appealing than speaking beautiful, life-giving words. For they release sweetness to our souls and inner healing to our spirits. I turn my words from the seeds of war and, and fear into the soothing oils of peace and comfort. I transform the fruits of my tongue from something that's bitter and pungent, something that people want to avoid. I change my words into something that's so sweet that people would crave, like honey from a honeycomb. Once again, you need to realize this message is not just about husbands and wives and children. It's far beyond that. It's much larger. The net is bigger. It, the scope is wider. It's, it's about husbands and wives and children and coworkers and friends and brothers and sisters and other relatives and anybody that comes into your circle of influence. I'm asking you all to be conscious of the fact that the atmosphere you bring 
into the atmosphere is key. You need to be conscious of, I need to be conscious of, of the atmosphere I bring into the atmosphere. You must be conscious of the atmosphere you bring into the atmosphere. We all must be conscious of that because whether we want to believe it or not, it is our posture that sets the stage. Turn to Colossians 3, verse 17, Amplified Classic. One final scripture here that directs us to monitor the way we interact with each other. The scripture is going to point us to, hey, listen, we need to make sure that we monitor how we interface with each other. Why? Because the way we interface with people has an effect on them. I particularly, I particularly like the way this scripture addresses fathers and husbands. Colossians 3, starting in verse 17, Amplified Classic. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon his person, giving praise to God the Father through him. Wives, be subject to your husbands, subordinate and adapt yourselves to them, as is right and fitting and your proper duty in the Lord, Husbands, listen up, husbands, love your wives, be affectionate and sympathetic with them. Do not be harsh or bitter or resentful toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord and fathers. Do not provoke or irritate or fret your children. Do not be hard on them or harass them. At least they become discouraged and sullen and more and morose and feel inferior and frustrated. Do not break their spirit. Verses 19 and 21, of course, really zero in on some good advice for husbands and fathers. But y'all know that advice applies to everybody. It says husbands and fathers, but it applies to everybody. What advice am I talking about? The instructions like be affectionate. Be sympathetic. Do not be harsh, bitter, or resentful. Do not break the spirit of our children. We especially should not be breaking the spirit of our children. We should be nurturing them to be everything that God has called them to be. Now, there are many other scriptures and words of wisdom that I could share with you involving people that come in our circle and how we affect the whole vibe that goes on there. But all of those things will ultimately, ultimately zero in back on the same basic message. Your posture sets the stage. As you are in your space, so shall your space be. Say this with me. My posture sets the stage. My posture sets the stage. As I am in my space. So shall, my space be. so shall my space be. Exactly. If you dress for peace, most likely those around you will come prepared for a peaceful engagement. But make no bones about it. If you suit up for war, you might very well get what you prepare for. In your parenting, you want to build good history with your children. You want them to see you for the blessing God put in their life. If you overdo it with aggression, if you overdo it with a lack of compassion, if you overdo it by not listening, 
Hmm. You could very much, in their mind, just be labeled as an aggressor. When we leave here today, I want us all to take this, the basics of this message to heart. Know that you are going to be extremely influential in every circle that you're in. You're not powerless. You, yes, you, you have the ability to set the stage. You can influence it heavily. I can't change it completely, but you can influence it heavily. Just know that your posture sets the stage. Now you have to apply this. I can tell you that this revelation is powerful. I can tell you from personal experience, but we can't just come to church and revelate. It must be applied. It must be applied. And for something to be applied and take root, it must be applied consistently. Pastor, I went home yesterday and I didn't argue with my wife and we still got a disagreement, so that stuff don't work. My brother, since we're all adults here, let's go ahead and since we have a boxing analogy, let's take the gloves off. How can you be so naive to think that you can change in 24 hours some bad behavior that you rooted that woman in for the past 15 years. So when I say your posture sets the stage, you need to keep setting that stage until all of that bad history, hey, listen, until your trust credit score is good enough for that woman to know that you really mean what you're saying. And of course, for every fella in the room, it goes for the women also. We always want to share the balance. Whatever it is, dear heart, that your character is that's been causing rifts in your relationship with that man all those years, just when you come and get the word from the Lord and I pray you apply it, just realize that the application of it has to be consistent enough for all of that bad history to fall off the other end. Look at it as a scale. If you have years of bad history, all your scale is weighted on bad history. One pebble on the good history side is not going to move that scale but you can do it because your posture sets the stage. And as you are in your space, so shall your space be. You apply that and you put it and you take it to heart and I guarantee you all of your relationships will thank you. Amen. We'll chat some more next week. Let's pray. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.